Freaking what up, dude? Um, it's Carter Wilson, and I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's gonna be called History is Dying. Dude. Friggin' what up, dude? Welcome to the straight up inaugural, dude. The primary ep of history is dank. I am fired up to be in the studio right now with my dog Aaron on the sticks, dude. What up? What up, dude? We're gonna freaking just straight up crush this, dude. Freaking spread some stoke, spread some knowledge, dude. I am. I am pumped, dude. I've been, I've been a little nervous, dude. I, but you know what? I found it. Like, what, what's helped me, dude? Is just, I've got my nice little podcast lean going here, dude. You know, before this, we started recording. I was in here. I was like, dude, what do we want to do? Do I want to hop in front of the G screen, dude? The green screen, throw up some graphics here, dude. You know, but I mean, this is a primary meeting. The primary mode of this medium is it's audio. You know what I mean? But we've got a visual component. We're gonna be putting stuff on YouTube, so. That could be tight, dude, for people to reference, dude. But, you know, if you're cruising to work in your car, dude, you can't be looking at your phone, dude. You know what I mean, dude? You can't be looking at maybe, I mean, maybe you got something illegal going on, one of those things that pops up, dude, that can't get jacked. You know what I mean? I see those things at Valet all the time, dude. Hit the button, the screen comes up like that. It's sick, makes a tight noise, you know what I mean? Then goes away when you put it in park. Maybe you got one of those. And, I mean, if you're in L.A., dude, you're on the 405. I mean, you're not you're not topping 15 MPH, dude. You're sitting on the freeway. You're chilling, dude. I mean, you could crush, like, honestly, dude, you could crush the probably all 15 season of G's anatomy, dude, just freaking in the 405, dude, one, on a one-way commute, dude. A little hyperbole there for you guys, dude, out of the gates, dude. Bringing the, bringing the chuckles, dude, right away, you know what I'm saying, dude? But, um, dude, so, so pumped for this pod. Um, just a little bit about it, kind of what to expect, I guess, um, if you're going to be listening and going on this dank journey, uh, freaking into the past with me dude so i'm fired up dude i've always been obsessed with like um you know doing time travel stuff i wish i could go back and just i have this like reoccurring dream i'm already i'm already born this is already water cooler talk i'm already that you know co-worker at work just being like hey man i had this dream last night uh, and then to get their attention i'm like you were in it and it's like all right well you're gonna have to listen for a little bit now that i told you in my dream what what happened was it some sexual stuff what's going on is this guy how weird is this guy you know what i mean and i'm like no 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 so it was tight it was tight dude. we were in ancient rome dude we were in togas dude we were oiled up, dude. You know what I'm saying? Dude? We're chilling, dude. Eating some grapes, dude. Crushing some wine, dude. You know what I mean, dude? Grapes and wine together. Maybe a little queso, dude, going with it, dude. Watching some gladiators rumble, dude. Freaking getting after it. And then, you know, by that point, dude's probably like, I got to go to a meeting or something like that. But uh, yeah, dude, I've been having this dream where I always get to just go back in like a nice pair of, you know, I'm very comfortable. I'm very mobile in my valet uniform, my pink polo, my khakis, dude. Good shoes. I can move around in feel like that could get me through any era honestly dude you go back in any time where are you going to go back to like you want to go back to like freaking straight up mesopotamia the cradle of civilization dude if you got a good pair of shoes dude it's going to get you a long way i feel like you know i could probably outrun any dudes that got beef with me you know i could pull a straight up aladdin jack some bread cruise around dude post up with my my best friend monkey dude freaking straight up just i don't know dude the frailty of modern man walk around barefoot for a while walk around barefoot for a summer, dude, straight up try to Laird Hamilton your feet, but uh, really is an interesting thing. But anyway, from the pod, what we're going to do is just going to give you guys out of the gates a nice little warm up. What's going on in my life, dude? Freaking straight up my recent history, dude. You know what I mean? Maybe that's called personal news. I don't know. But just, you know, keep that tight, dude. Let you know what's going on with me and the GF, dude. How the credenza's posting up, dude. It's been recently shined, dude. That freaking shirt of Kremlin the Phil marble, dude. Something that I would see if I went back to ancient Rome. I'd see that type of marble. I'd get pumped on it, dude. Freaking just go around shopping for floors, dude. You know what I mean? For me, my GF's future abode, dude. Would love. If I could, dude, if I could time travel, I'd go past and just be like, just get good decorative ideas. You know, I'd be like, oh, dude, cruise into a Roman atrium. Be like, oh, this could be nice. A little remodel here to take out that wall in our future house. Let's knock down that wall. Let's get this space flowing. You know, we want to entertain. Are we going to be the couple that entertains? You know, we're going to have little backyard parties on Saturdays, dude, that have end times, dude. That's when you know you're entering the adult zone, dude. When your parties have an end time, dude, because you got to go up and it's never on a Sunday, dude. Because a Sunday, dude, I'm gearing up for the week. You know what I mean? I got to get stuff done. 
you know, I got to make dinner, dude. Got to make my lunches that that I put in the fridge that I stock for the whole week. You know what I mean? Take take care of stuff, get things done, gear up. But on Saturday, I can have a little bit of fun. You know, I wake up, I'm not tired from Friday from work, and I, you know, kids are uh, they're active. They come over, they run around for a few hours. They're tired, they come back, dude. Me and the GF chill. We post up, we watch a movie, and then he does make another kit. Be sick. Be tight. But anyway. Just do a little bit of my recent history, dude. Then I'll get into what I like to call the historical share. That's going to be, that's going to be the crux. That's going to be the essence of the pod. You know what I mean? And uh, I'll have a topic each week. Sometimes you guys can write in and do some. I've already gotten some emails that have fired me up about some future eps. So I love that, dude. I'm, I'm very, very stoked. And honestly, learning a lot. Dude. There's some freaking intelligent dudes and ladies out there that are bringing the heat, historical heat, and I'm loving it, dude. So it's. It's a lot to live up to, but I got my podcast lane, so I'm, so I'm feeling comfortable. Um, it's a little bit of Yellowstone. On the inside, I'm nervous, but look at this. Can't see it because you're listening to a pod, but, I mean, can you hear it? You hear how my voice is going down there? Hear how, like, right now I could be a pilot. Just tell you, if you look out the right side of your window, we're going over the Grand Canyon. That was formed over millennia, so millennia, millions of years. And once it was probably a mighty river, the, you know, elk and moose down there. You know, some wolves cruising around. Imagine if a, your pilot just was obsessed with wolves and some wolves down there. You know, the alpha wolf, sort of the alpha pilot of Delta. I'm a lone wolf, I have a co-pilot. I tell him, as soon as we get in the cockpit, go to sleep. I don't even care if we're just going, you know, LA to Phoenix, take a nap. I got this bird, this bird's in my hands. You know, they say the condor's the mightiest bird in the sky, but is DC-12 which would be too big of a plane to take from LA to Phoenix, but I told them I gotta deal with the airlines. You give me the biggest bird you got. That's the only plane I'm flying. That'd be me if I was a pilot. Did you see how fucking cool that sounded right there? It's my first F-bomb on the pod. What up? It took me a while. Told myself I wasn't gonna swear. Fucking had to. Got too nervous. The geyser hit me, the Yellowstone geyser. Bursted. Anyway. Um, let's dive in, dude. So just a little bit about me and my GF, dude. Um, recently been uh, crushing some puzzles, dude. Been sick, dude. Been crushing some Charles Weiss sockies, dude. I didn't even know about this. I posted this on the gram, dude. What up? And uh, some dude commented. He was like, dude, Charles Weiss sockie, the Cadillac of puzzles. And I got to tell you right now, correct. 100% correct. These puzzles, they are fun. They're a good time. They are... He's always capturing, you know, a bygone era of America. So it kind of ties in. That's why I wanted to talk about it. It's like, you know, there's a lot of folklore in these puzzles. It's like, dude, dude the amount, they're kind of, the way you can do a Charles Weiss hockey puzzle, here's my biggest hint. Do the American flags first. There's probably 15 to 30 American. I don't even care if it's a close up on a dude's face. The dude's going to have some American flag ink on his face. You know, that's what it's going to be. I mean, we did one called, um, Oh, dang, what was it called? Lost in the Woodies or something like that. It was those like old school wooden boats, which would be sick to cruise around on. Kind of like the Last Crusade, like Italian boats that he gets, you know, when they're cruising through Venice, which is sick, dude. And uh, yeah, so it's like those boats and it's, you know, tons of American flags. It looks like a place you'd like to vacation with your family, you know, get yourself like, a, you know, up, you know, Northeast America in the summer, a lot of that stuff, maybe Middle America. So fire, fire puzzles. And I'll tell you, the biggest challenge of doing a puzzle is not the mental. I do love the mental challenge. I do love the bonding my GF and I are doing. We're making chamomile teas, dude. You know, sometimes I'll make myself a nice ginger tea for the tom-tom, dude. You know, because I got weird stomach stuff going on that I don't even know about, dude. You know what I mean? If I look at my stomach the wrong way, it starts to grumble sometimes. Probably because I'm crushing so many dippas, dude. But I love some dippas. Dude, I'll, I'll chug a cold brew at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., dippa. Let's go. In between that, breakfast burrito. Then I'm like, why is my stomach hurt? Oh, yeah. I've been housing this acidic shit all day long, but it's so good. It's just so good. But uh, yeah, dude, the mental sweat, the emotional bonding, very, very beneficial. The very, the pros of doing a Charles Wysocki dang puzzle. The cons, my neck and back took a pounding, dude. Took a unbelievable pound. I'm, dude, I had a knot. I've got a roller for my feet doing valet, dude. I got like this sick little... Went to Roadrunner, dude, freaking got this sick little, like, Laird Hamilton. I, I'm, I'm fired up about Laird Hamilton right now. I've been watching his vids. But uh, it's like a golf ball, but it's got little uh, spokes or spikes in it, you know, I mean, to get more uh, points, you know, the surface area, dude, you know, when you got snowshoes, 
you're using snowshoes, you spread out the surface area so you don't just fall on the snow. Opposite effect when you got this rolling out ball. Let's get some little pointed stuff going here. Let's really get into those muscles. Let's work out the knots. In, in circles is what it's all about. I was crushing YouTube videos, gaining illicit knowledge, dude. Finding stuff out, dude. You're watching it get done, you know? And uh, so I was working circles on my neck. And I even used that ball that's meant for my feet. Set, r laid down on my rug and just rolled it out on my neck. It did work great, but yeah, dude. If you do a puzzle, dude, stretch out. I don't Do your hammies. I don't care. No matter what you're doing, stretch out your hammies. I don't care if you're taking the SATs. I don't care if you're going to work. I don't care if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation at work. I don't care if you're piling a plane over the Grand Canyon. You know what I mean? We're just going to take a quick detour over Wyoming. Got to look out there. So I'm done, you know. Dude, if you're a pilot and a cowboy, sick mashup. Cowboy mashed up with any other profession, sick. I'm a Wall Street guy, but I dress like a cowboy. That's a move. And you can get away with wearing a vest. Just be a leather one. Be tight instead of Patagonia. It'd be tight. It's a good move. If you're wondering how to get, you know, get an identity at work where people will respect you, you know what I mean? You're probably an alpha male in the office named like Kevin or something like that, dude. Who's dropping, you know, no, who calls you the golf guy. You've never watched golf or something. You know, he labels you and then you got to be that. You know, what you, what you got to do is label yourself. Go cowboy guy. But don't be all hat and no cattle. Got to go out and learn how to ride. Get yourself in a healthy post. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and uh, anyway, oh, dude, a little puzzle story I wrote down here that I wanted to talk about one time. A little quick horror story. Here's a quick horror story. I was doing a puzzle. <clears throat> Me and my GF, it was, uh, we recently went to a wedding for my buddy Brooks, um, who's having a kid soon. Congrats to little Johnny, dude. What up? And um, we uh, went to this town called Solvang which is a sick little town, a little north and east of Santa Barbara, which is one of the dankest cities in California. And Solvang is tight, little Dutch-infused town. I looked up, I did a little research. What up? Here we go, dude. Dropping some research here. Uh, Freaking, the city was founded in 1911, dude. Okay, officially founded in 1911. Um, between Rancho Carlos de Juanata, uh, it was a Mexican land grant by a group of Danes who traveled west to establish a Danish community far from the Midwestern winters. I get it, dude. Get out to that Cali weather. You know what I'm saying, dude? And the best part is you cruise up there, get yourself a nice little evil skeever when you're up there, just these dank little fried things, insert it with like raspberry filling, very bomb. Probably can only have one or two though, especially if you're uh, eating one with a dank little dipper. you know what I'm saying, dude? And then maybe you've seen the movie Sideways, just to give you reference for this town. That's where the movie Sideways was filmed. Hitching Post, dude, freaking Giamatti crushing steaks, dude. Love that, dude. Thomas Hayden Church. Amazing performance by that dude, freaking busting me up. That movie, rewatchability factor, huge, huge, huge rewatchability factor. If you're on a plane, dude, and sideways is available, watch it. You're you're getting through that flight and you're loving it. You know what I mean, dude? Honestly, a date night. Watch that movie because Giamatti and Virginia Madsen, Maya, is their character's name in the movie. Stellar performance, and you know, you got uh, what's his name? Uh, Giamatti's obsessed with the Pinot Noir, the Noir grape. In that movie, he says, oh, you have to coax the, the flavor out of it. It takes so much care and maintenance, and that's why he loves it, because when it's done right, it's so amazing, and it's often done so wrong. It can be very clay-tasting. I've been to Napa, and it can talk about these things, dude. Tannins, Spartan, earthy, dude. Just basically, any, someone, anytime someone drops wine knowledge, I'm like, dude, you like to get buzzed. Just come on, dude. I'm not talking about the uh, robust flavor of a BL smooth tall boy I'm chugging down, dude. I don't even care if it's a Clamata. I'll take it to the dome if I've got my buzz going on, dude. I'm on the pong table. Let's get it going. You know what I mean? Fill up these cups, dude. But, uh, I mean, you know, you got um, freaking Giamatti is the noir grape in that movie when he does that great monologue. I would go rewatch that monologue if you got the time at work today, dude. You know what I mean? Just, and you know you got the time at work today. Just watch it, dude. Act like you're doing work, but take that in, dude. Maybe cry about it. Say you're passionate about the work to your boss. It's just amazing, dude. The way these numbers are coming together this quarter, we're, we're bringing it down. It's amazing, dude. We're we're straight up. We're within that six six sigma, dude. You know what I mean? Dude? We're we're not deviating at all from our numbers. It's amazing. But really, you're watching Giamatti's uh, new war monologue, and you're loving it, and you're absolutely loving it. And dude, Virginia Madsen, she's the. Um, I think it's like a. What is it when you study wine Ver verticulture? Aaron, do you know what it is? Viticulture. Yeah, I think viticulture. Viticulture. Verticulture would be for like a dude who catches fat air. Maybe Sean White would be a, a verticulturist or Michael Jordan. Fat, fat air. Um, by the way, I've been crushing the Jordan doc. It's sick. Have you been watching it, Aaron? I haven't yet, no. I'm not going to say. I mean, obviously there's there's new information. I mean, we all know what happens, but it's, it's freaking sick, dude. But uh, yeah, dude. So 
just a little bit about me, dude. Been freaking crushing. Oh, but dude, no, no, no. This is the horror story. So we're crushing this dank puzzle about Solvang, and this was when I was living with GF, with uh, JT, and um, <clears throat> my GF was would come over, and you know we'd you know open a nice little bottle of wine, probably not a, a noir, probably an eight dollar fucking Merlot, and um, we would uh, work on it for like three weeks. It's a hard puzzle, dude. It was a hard, a lot of detail. It was a puzzle of the town, a lot of detail, very Wysocki esque. Not that many American flags, but. It was that of a, of, a, of a bygone era. It felt like, you know, uh, uh, time had passed, you know, 1900s, um, uh, or excuse me, 1800s America. And um, my buddy Joe was moving up to LA at the time, and it was hilarious. He wasn't crashing on our couch because he had bought a couch for his apartment and moved it in, so he was crashing on, our own ca- on his own couch, but in our apartment. It was sick. It was pretty unique, so I, I just uh, get a kick out of that. And uh, it was a nice ass couch. I'd sit on it from time to time, and maybe that's why he felt he had the right to uh, finish the puzzle, dude. Like he was just chilling one day, toked to balls on a nice Saturday, you know, getting through a hard work week, and he saw the puzzle there and just couldn't resist it, and just finished it. You know, and me and my GF did all the hard work. My neck taking a pounding, dude, having to do you know muscle exercises, looking for chiropractors and stuff, trying to get this puzzle done. And then my dog Joe, who I love. He finished it. Sick. I've forgiven him. You know, it hurts. The process, though. You don't just forgive and forget. You know, I'm still in the forgetting phase, I guess. And anyway, um, that's the that's the quick horror story of that puzzle. You know, don't... It's interesting etiquette because it was out on a shared table. So it's like, is this a, like an apartment puzzle? But everyone in the apartment, my buddy Greg lived there too. What up, Greg? And JT, they knew they weren't going to touch the puzzle. They'd look at him. Maybe they snuck a piece in here or there. What are you going to do? But finish it? You kidding me? You're going to finish it? Unbelievable, dude. I forgive you, dude. I forgive you, dude. Okay, dude. So, why am I talking about history? Why am I doing this? You know, because one, I've always been fired up by it, dude. And two, maybe, you know... My parents got through to me. Did every vacation felt like a punishment growing up? This is very spoiled of me to talk about. I was I was very fortunate, very lucky enough growing up in Orange County. Um, great weather, amazing stuff, dude. Um, dank food, amazing tuna, dude. I think you know tuna was like my second meal, dude. You know it was like breast milk and then boom, yellowfin, dude. And uh, freaking, it's just every vacation I went on was had to have some sort of like lesson behind it like you could never relax you know what i mean dude like went to hawaii once dude and i had to take like a tour it was just like pearl harbor i don't even think i saw the beach dude you know the whole time i was there of course i crushed a nice oreo milkshake dude and went down a lot water slide it was the best time of my life and i saw my uh, camp counselor from when i went to summer camp from a few years before just hammered and i didn't understand that time i was like 10 just hammered on a bachelor party and i was like legolos because the counselors you'd like used like these uh different names and then at the end like you found out their real name it was kind of cool but like uh so we'd call him legolas the whole time and which is a fire counselor name i think his real name was like Devin. but um <laughs> uh i'm like walking by just like with a, a, a milkshake in my hand and he's just buzzed in a jacuzzi like talking to some ladies with his bros and this 10 year old kid comes up to him and i'm like legolas <laughs> and then i remember everyone in the jacuzzi looks at him and he was just like oh what up strider and uh it was just hilarious. They're all like, what, this kid just called you Legolos? How does he know that? It was amazing. I want to say maybe I helped him meet his future wife. You know, if not, I think I helped him have a good time. And that's all that counts. So anyway, I went on all these vacations. You know, you know, they can't say you can't force things. When you're your parenting, it's tough. You kind of got to like trick or manipulate your kids into stuff like, oh, hey, I don't know if we can sign you up for basketball because and then your kid's going to want to play basketball. You take something from them, they're going to want. Everyone knows that. About, you know, it's just human nature for some reason. Uh, but the reverse effect worked here where it was just forced on me. Like, uh, remember we got to go to Europe one summer and all I wanted to do was chill, dude, with my freaking dogs. I wanted to chill with JT. I wanted to play freaking brew pong at 10 a.m., get the keg ordered up, dude. You know what I mean? And just hang out by the pool and just dance with my dogs. But I was like, dude, I'm not going to be able to do this for two weeks. Got to go to Europe, which is such a privilege and amazing thing to do. But I was at the time, I was like, oh, I'm so burdened. This sucks so bad. This is, you know, it's pretty out of touch. But guys, this is my truth. This is my story. I'm being so, guys, this is a podcast. This is the most brave and honest medium in the world. This is so goddamn brave and honest right now. Okay. Talking about me as a young kid having to go to Europe and missing out on a good time with my boys. It's brave and honest. You know what I mean? Brave and honest. And uh, honestly, it was just a blur. 
All I remember is just sleeping in buses, showering very infrequently. This was probably maybe sophomore year of high school at this time. Showering very infrequently, going to, marching around very hot, smelling B.O. everywhere from tourists being packed in in the August heat because, you know, my dad, we, we would, we'd want to go when it was a little bit cheaper to go with the, the uh, hot weather. You know, you don't want to go in the, the good weather. It's going to be more expensive. And uh, just getting freaking just pounded by B.O., passing out on buses, looking at, you know, sculptures and some art and stuff and, uh, you know, just drilling myself. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of siblings finding some way to just drill myself in the shower, acting like, hey, that pasta didn't agree with me, or, oh, dude, we had shellfish at dinner. I never eat shellfish. But just enjoying myself in the hotel room. And, uh, you know, probably the only highlight of my trip, you know, going to Pompeii, uh, checking some stuff out, just waiting to get back to the hotel room and absolutely go to town on myself. And, um, you know, it was really a, a journey of, what every European trip is as an adult, self-discovery. You know, I was discovering self-love and honestly, apparently an appreciation for the past at the time. Um, now it's grown. Now I'm fired up by it. And I'm like, dude, I've been doing valet a lot. I got to step things up, dude. I've been so fortunate to have my dogs, Chad and JT, and um, help me out getting this this going. So now I'm like, you know, you got to have something that you're passionate talking about. Otherwise, you guys... You know, you got to be you got to be honest and true to you. Otherwise, you, you're not going to want to listen to someone talk about something that's forced. And guess what? This stuff comes pretty fun. I'm fired up by it. I'm telling you, I, want, I got these time travel dreams. I want to be. What would it be like to be inserted back there? You know what I mean? What would it be? What would it be like to be a bro? I don't know. Posting up, modeling while an artist carves the terracotta army. Terracotta army. You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's a dude they had a model for those things. Like there's, they're all unique looking structures that are not the same, the ones that they've discovered. What was that like? Was that person forced to do that? Was that like a, uh, a scenario of forced labor in that point? Honestly, dude, if it's forced labor and it's modeling, maybe that's the tightest thing you could have. And you're talking to an artist. That's pretty sick. But at the same time, it's oppressive. So that's not tight. These are the type of things we're going to dive into. What's the context? What were the people at the time possibly going through? What was possibly going through their domes? during those times. You know what I mean? We can never know. We can only speculate, but it's fun to speculate. It's fun to go back there and ask yourself, and I think we always do this during watching action movies, you know, sick movies like Braveheart. We ask ourselves, how would we react? You know, we put ourselves in the protagonist character and Giamatti in Sideways. What would I be like if I was this dude trying to write a book, you know, who I thought I had higher expectations for my myself in life, but now I'm just a teacher, you know? And teachers are undervalued. And I can see how he beats himself up. He's trying to do this very, uh, you know, erudite book or whatever the hell he's trying to write in that movie, you know, Tolstoy-esque or something like that. It's super long, right? And, uh, you know, maybe he feels like a failure, failed marriage. And um, I don't know, I'm just getting going down a rabbit hole sideways. I watched it recently with my GF. She loved it. It was amazing. But anyway, we're going to try to get inside the domes of other characters. And also, I think a great way to have, you know, a lot, a big form of, <clears throat> of compassion today is understanding and, you know, having siblings and these relationships. Sometimes we'll get into tiffs and we know how to, you know, hit each other's buttons, even with your best boys. You know what I mean? Often the people we love the most, you'll butt the heads with the most because you can be honest about it. They know you and you know them and you can see <clears throat> what's really behind different decisions and everything. And I think the best way in, in the way to be most human now is trying to discover and this was a sick um, quote that I got is, uh, we are the sum, uh, the shared sum of all of our past experiences from this dank uh, professor I signed up for an online uh, uh, historical course when I, when I was doing this pod. So fired up, dude, what up? Bragging about that, dude, signed up for it, dude. Crushing it, dude. I've only gotten, it's about uh, six hours of lectures. I'm about 15 minutes in, in about three weeks. So fired up on that, dude, just crushing it. But I like that, you know what I mean? With the sum of our experiences today, we're products of that. So let's look to the past and try to under, understand ourselves. Let's try to understand someone on the other side of the globe, someone who is a coworker that we don't get along with. Well, what's his deal, dude? Maybe he's from NorCal, dude. That's why I don't get him, dude. Maybe he's from Humboldt, dude. You know, that's why he's blazing so much, dude. You know, maybe it's giving him a hang. I don't know. Let me try to understand it. Let's study where it, where it came from. Let's study dudes from NorCal. You know, why do they want to get calf tattoos and then, you know, put of California and then put you know stars next to where you know the Giants play or something like that. Why? I mean, you know, that's that's a pretty easy one to discover. Doesn't you know to me to Dick Tracy to figure that out, but 
who was the first dude to get the calf tattoo? That's something we might want to dive into on this pod. You know what I mean? So also, dude, um, in college I was, and I'm not, I don't want to brag here. I was a unit away from becoming a history minor, um, but I didn't want to take the extra class. I wanted to really enjoy my last semester, do some raging, and only take three class. And I shouldn't say semester because I was at UC San Diego. They're on the quarter system there, which is weird. And um, yeah, I was like, dude, I want to do some raging. I want to enjoy this. And I'm like, my real it doesn't. No one's ever looked at my transcript once in my life. I mean, dude, all I had to do to get a valid job was just lie about being able to drive stick shift. And then I learned it on the job, dude. Boom, came out coming out honest right there, dude. Told you again, I'm being brave and honest. Podcast, and that was it. No one said, "Hey, man, let me see what your grades were. What was your GPA?" No, let's go. Come on, dude. So, honestly, I think it's just about intellectual curiosity, and that's what we're we're scratching that itch on here, and I think that's what it's all about. And I mean, dude, honestly, bro, you might learn some tight facts. It's just sick to know some freaking facts and be able to drop it at a party and just walk out. You know what I mean, dude? Just tight, dude. You know what I mean? I mean, dude, I want to, I want to, dude, I want to examine what's it like being a bro on bunk, being a bro in Bunker Hill on this podcast, dude. Defending your GF across the harbor from the Brits, dude. You know what I mean, dude? And what's your GF doing? She's probably, you know, making muskets or freaking, you know, just, you know, doing something to help out the cause. You know what I mean? That's sick, dude. Let's dive into that, dude. And, dude, we want to talk about how exactly, how, exactly how legit was. Gilgamesh, dude, from the legend of Gilgamesh, the oldest known literature that we have, you know, uh, written on clay tablets. That's sick. Why clay? Let's figure that out, dude. And just facts, dude. Everything about from freaking Vikings to astronauts. And honestly, in my opinion, I think they had a lot in common. You know what I'm saying, dude? And I think I'm just fired up. So I think, honestly, dude, at this point, I think it's time to to dive in. You know what I mean? Let's let's dive into this historical share, dude. I vamped enough. It's probably the most vamping I'll do. Um, in future reps, I'll just do a little share and we'll get into it, dude. So here we go. This was a tough decision for me to be like, all right, this is the first step. What am I going to talk about, dude? What am I going to talk? There's so much. There's so much. It's a blessing and a curse. It's first episode. There's literally any direction you can go, but then what direction? It's a big fear in life. You know what I mean? Sometimes that freedom is, is can can be daunting, you know, um, especially with an artist like myself. Now that I'm doing a podcast, I'm an artist. I consider, myself, consider myself to be an artist. Consider myself to be an artist. Um, I was like, dude, what am I going to talk about, dude? All of history through space and time. Fictional worlds described in ancient texts. Could dive into those. Viking mythology, Greek mythology. What do I want to do? Talk about, I already mentioned Mesopotamia, the cradle of the Civ, the Mayas, who in my opinion are really undersold, you know, the Western gaze, we're going to talk about a lot. I can't help it. We, pre we preach from where we stand, you know, uh, there's so much about the Romans. We've discovered so much, you know, l luckily a lot of it was intact. Then in the, you know, in the Americas and with, you know, the conquistadors, everything has this European tilt to it that's being forced on it. And I think the Mayas get a lot of, are getting disrespected, especially after reading that dank book, Lost City of the Monkey God, um, gained a lot of sick knowledge. I mean, the advancements that were there were huge. You know, they're on point with these Western European civilizations and surpassed in a lot of ways. And do I go with that? Do I go into a Buddhist floating world? Do we talk about just this floating world? Am I going in there? Am I talking about dinosaurs? That's natural history. I'll mainly focus on, you know, human stuff want to, you know, get into, figure out, you know, fellow bros and stuff, dude, you know what I mean? But, you know, cavemen, dude, what's going on there, dude? These guys are painting, dude. These are artists, bro. They're putting stuff on, on walls in these French caves, dude. You know what I mean, dude? Putting stuff of them wrestling and running, which are two of the oldest sports, by the way. And, uh, sick little fact right there, dude. Um, yeah. So I'm like, what am, am I choosing? The, am I talking about big figure, Napoleon? Do I want to talk about figures? You know, Joan of Arc? Do I want to talk about, and I'm like, you know what, dude, I just got fired up on pirates. I just got fired up on pirates. They're sick. They're sick. Um, and they get a bad rap. And I get why. Yes, they murdered. Yes, they stole. People screw up. People screw up. No one's perfect. Why did they murder? Why did they steal? Was it because, and I got a sick question today, and I'm referencing this now from a, a high school history teacher. He goes, he asked about this, which was amazing. So I'm fired up. Um, and it was what I was already intending to talk about in the first step was sick pirates because I got fired up on it. Uh, 
did they become did they have these murderous treacherous you know backstabbing ways which history is written by the victors uh, according to our I think our, our boy Churchill did Churchill say that Aaron who said that or is that just like a known common phrase uh, that, that, they, that I don't know specifically no. yeah but that's a known thing you know the victor yeah. they're gonna write the history of what's going on you know the enemy's been defeated they're done they've been sold off or killed or whatever or brought into the the empire but um it's uh what am i saying here these freaking victors are writing the history right and so why they're they're the ones giving the, the english and the spanish are the ones giving the rap that we know today about pirates but maybe it's you know maybe it was the social immobility that's what this high school teacher was talking about the social immobility part did it force them into this situation or did they do it because it was fun because it was sick I don't know I don't know we got to find out okay and there's a there's a figure that I think can shed a little bit of light on this and that's who I got fired up to talk about today and his name is Joseph Bannister this is a great pirate pirate story I uh, learned about this dude dude reading this book that my bro recommended uh, called Pirate Hunters, which is a sick book and uh, written by Robert Curson. And it's about two bros, um, John Chatterton, who's an epic deep sea diver and his um, partner at the time, John Madeira, I believe. And it's about them looking for, you know, lost Spanish galleons in the Caribbean. And, um, you know, they're setting out to find one and they're looking for this ship called the Golden Fleece in the books about their journey trying to find the Golden Fleece, which is sick. I recommend reading it. And, um, uh, but the captain that, um, the dude who was the captain of the Golden Fleece was Joseph Bannister and the Golden Fleece was a merchant ship. So he was a merchant captain, which at the time, and we're talking 17th century Caribbean here, right? We're talking height of the Caribbean, of, of piracy, European piracy, you know, in uh, the Caribbean area. And this is sick. This is where like the movies come from and everything. Although, you know, as soon as boats were invented, you know, freaking Viking longships, Chinese uh, vessels from back in the day and, uh, you know, Greek stuff, you know, we're talking like uh, Odysseus style vessels. There was always pirates on the sea, dude, I'm sure. As soon as a boat was was put in the water, there was pirates putting it out somewhere else. And, um, you know, so, but we're talking about 17th century Caribbean. We're talking about Joseph Bannister, freaking pirates, dude. So sick, dude. And let me um, let me go ahead and just before we get into his story, just sort of maybe force my opinion here a little bit on just um, why I think pirates are so so legit. Um, just some great stuff about pirate code here. Um, what I love is that the captain, so Bannister was a captain. Um, and if you were, he was a merchant captain, but if you were a pirate captain, um, you were, that was just a position that you had. Like you were literally in charge of the boat. You would, you know, navigate. You'd say, hey, dude, host that sail over there, bro. You'd say, all right, let's, do we want to go try to jack this Spanish galleon over here? Or are we over it? Are we good? Do we have enough rum? And then the crew would vote on that. So really it was just like almost, and this is an interesting thing to tackle, early stages of democracy in the new Americas. Did, the, did it first take place on these pirate vessels? I don't know. That's that's an interesting argument I'm not quite equipped to make, but it fires me up to think about it, dude. These captains just being like, dude, what do we want to do today? Do we want to bronze, dude? Do we want to, do we want to soak our perenniums, dude? I'm, I would be surprised if pirates knew about soaking their perenniums back in the day, getting that vitamin D, dude. You know what I mean? Sipping on some rum, sipping on some drink called Kill Devil, which was literally just freaking rum mixed with gunpowder. Imagine getting fired up on that, dude. Working up, I mean, maybe you need a little bit of courage to go jack a vessel, dude, and you're like, all right, dude, let me get some kill devil on me, man. Let's go, dude. That would be sick, dude. That sounds like something like, like, dude, you know, maybe if you're, a, I'm obsessed with Wall Street, dude. If you're working on Wall Street, you get some kill devil, dude, you are making deals that day, dude. So fired up on that uh, position as, um, you know, captains do just as a position. I didn't know that. And honestly, I, I was looking up in, um, read some stuff in the times like if you were working on a merchant ship dude captains were pretty brutal dude like they would withhold wages from guys like honestly it was yeah you 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 know it was a paid position but it was honestly more like uh you know forced labor type 
type situation. It was not chill. You were on the seas. You're away from your family if you had one, but maybe a lot of times sailors didn't because that you know they went into that type of career. But it was just uh, it was tough. And how what was the upward mobility and how long did it take? Like it would take years. Dude, Bannister was running. Um, he would do transatlantic trips, which could take anywhere from three weeks to three months, depending on weather. And it was a highly skilled position. So he was a good, good captain. And uh, he came from, you know, like modest means. He was a British dude. So he had citizenship, which was huge at the time. If you had that, and we'll get into why. But it, uh, you know, you, were, you weren't really going to advance, you know. So if you're a, a crew member on one of these ships, what's going to keep you from going and scoring some of the loot? And, you know, a privateering contract or something like that on another ship where you got some freedom, you know, where, where honestly, dude, if you murk some guy on a ship and you want to steal a scarf or put in an earring, no one's going to make fun of you for it. You know, everyone's going to, everyone's going to love it. You want to put some beads in your beard? Go for it, dude. You're a pirate now. You're free. Express yourself. I love the freedom of expression in piracy. I mean, honestly, dude, I, um, I remember I bought Airwalks. In middle school, I bought a pair of Airwalks that were sick, but I, I got the Airwalks that were like the red, um, shiny ones. And then I came to school and like all my buddies had Airwalks. So I was like sick, now I got a pair. And I remember just being made fun of, being like, "What are you trying to do? You're trying to, you're trying to fit in wearing those Airwalks, and they're not even the sick ones. Your mom got you the wrong ones. They knew I went shopping with my mom that day, or that weekend, and it just felt bad the judgment. And I'd like to imagine being a pirate, bro." If you murked some dude on a ship that had airwalks or something like that, dude, you wore them, no one's batting an eye because you earned those things. You know what I mean? Maybe that was the problem with me in middle school. I didn't earn the airwalks. Maybe if I punched in, you know, got a shift at like Wild Rivers or something like that. It was like a water park in the summer that was open, you know, telling kids when they can go down the slide or not, and I earned the airwalks. Maybe I could have had a better argument. Anyway, um... All crew members would get equal share of the loot. So if you do jack some airwalks, you could be like, bro, I think these would look sick on you to one of your pirate buddies. And he'd be like, dude, thank you so much, bro. Honestly, dude, I think this sword that has the weird curve on it right now that I got from this, um, you know, this dude, this freaking British captain, dude, for some reason that he got, he probably traded for it in a legit way. But honestly, dude, now he's going to join our crew. And when he joined up, we did jack him, which wasn't chill of us, but that's kind of, we all went through that. It's kind of him being a rookie of our crew. And I think you should take his sword. And oh, dude, thank you so much, dude. I need that, dude. And um, I love this, dude. Battle injury had monetary compensation, which is great. If you lost an arm, it was 600 pieces. That's quite a bit at the time. Like if you were putting on trial in like Port Royal, which was probably the biggest city at the time um, in the Caribbean, like the 17th century, uh, like 20 pieces would be bail, depending on how serious the crime was. Um, so this was a lot. You know, you could get yourself a lot of rum. You could really do some enjoying. Uh, if you lost your arm, it was 600 pieces if you lost your right arm, 500 if you lost your left arm, which only makes me imagine pirates were drilling themselves with their right hand. A leg was 500, <clears throat> 400 for the left, 500 for the right. Honestly, dude, I don't know if I'm taking a leg or an arm. What's more valuable here? Maybe the arm, I guess maybe for sailing or something like that. You can get a peg leg and just chill and no one's really swimming. And I was 100. I don't know about the scaling on these things. I mean, I'm fired up about this, that you get compensated for battle wounds and it's kind of sick. It's a little badge of honor and a little something, you know. Hey, go enjoy yourself. Appreciate you sac making the sacrifice. Um, like, you know, like a good football coach or something. But like, I don't know, 100 for an eye? I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, it reminds me of this Russian proverb. It was like uh, from this dank book that I read. I might have shared this. I'm going deep. But it was like, uh, if you... It's like, okay, this genie or whatever comes down and is like, uh, I can grant you, I'm going to grant you a wish, but know this, uh, whatever you wish for, your neighbor will get two of. And the guy goes, uh, take my eye. <laughs> so he'll have one eye and all his neighbors will be blind and he will be the king. Interesting um, outlook on uh, their shared perspective that that's a proverb. That's the type of stuff that I want to be getting into. And what's the shared perspective of these pirate guys? I'm, I'm loving that it's no judgment. I'm loving that they're doing, you know, that they're cruising around pulling off heists. What a dream, dude. You're part of a heist crew getting bronze with your boys in the Caribbean. I mean, it's amazing, dude. Why am I going to go post up in England where it's cold, you know, and, you know, be, maybe be a Thatcher and making nets. Why not go out and use one of those nets? 
catch myself a dank marlin off the Caribbean, you know, a Dorado, cook it up with my dogs on the ship, dude. You know what I mean? Be sick. Um, love this. There was an incentive program. There's bonuses for ba bravery. You'd get pieces. If you spotted a target ship first, you got a bonus. And imagine that stoke being like, oh, dude, there it is. I see the mast right there. Looks like it's probably a 16 cannoner. We can probably take this, dude. We got 20 cannons. Let's go. And we're coming up behind it. We've got and we've got fog on our side. But I saw it because I got two eyes. Didn't want to get compensated 100 bucks for just one of them. Figured I want to protect my eyes in battle. Got these six go sick goggles that I murked off some French dude did on our last raid. And so let's go. That's sick, dude. You imagine you know when you're cruising in a, with your boys, dude. You're cruising in a jeep and you're like. Oh, dude, there's the breakfast burrito spot. A's Burgers, it's up ahead on the right. And you see it, and everyone's like, oh, dude, I've been starving. Let's go. Imagine that stoke, but times 20. Um, I talked about this a little bit, but I wrote down, um, you know, privateers, which is kind of what the etymology of pirates comes from. So if you, a lot of times, the Spanish and English were warring at these, these times, and uh, they would take out contracts f for these pirates allow them to use Port Royal as a harbor and not just cruise to Tortuga, which was a freaking legit debaucherous town. But uh, they would just, they would ha have access to the harbor, you know, maybe some English supplies. They'd have these contracts and be like, I have papers, uh, I can be here, it's okay. If they get pulled over by British authorities or whatever at the time, or maybe other, maybe Spanish authorities if they're on a Spanish contract. So it's really these empires kind of using these, some, you know, mercenaries, I guess, at this time against each other. So I don't know who's at fault here. These pirates are just trying to live a dank life, making ends meet. Sure, they murked guys. Yeah, they did this, but people mess up. These are desperate times. This is this is the 1700s. These are different eras, dude. This isn't today. Although being a pirate, you imagine being a pirate in like Newport Harbor against yachts, dude. You might not be able to get a lot get away for long, but you'd have a sick three hour run. Um let's see, dude. Oh, okay, I wrote this down. The Treaty of Madrid, 1670, turned the tide of piracy. Um which is a fire pun that I wrote down, the tide of piracy. So I was just fired up on that. Not about the cleaning product, but the waves in the ocean and the pirates are on the waves. So I get fired up on puns, dude. So look out when those come. I'll definitely be patting myself on the back as those come along. Um, you know, they, they after that Treaty of Madrid, they wanted uh, predictable seas. You know, the pirates were just murking too much. They were making a killing, dude. Another pun right there. Thank you, dude. Didn't write that one down. That was off the cuff. And honestly, dude, I feel pretty good about it, even though somewhat insensitive to the dudes that they murked. Um, but anyway, dude, um, uh, let's see. So then in Port, in Port, back in Port Royal, uh, the governor, this dude, Thomas Lynch, dude, right? He calls the Royal Navy to send some big ass ships, dude, to the region to put an end to piracy in 1680. So this Treaty of Madrid didn't, which was in 1670. Now we're talking a 10 year period here where pirates are still cruising around, doing their work. I mean, these guys know the Caribbean better. You know, some new ship comes over. They're going to want a captain who's familiar with the area, but these guys live in this area. They're, they're the locals of their, of that area now, so they know these little islands. Do you remember that that freaking Firefest documentary where John Chatterton and John Madera were looking for the Golden Fleece was like um, the key of, um, or is in Samana Bay, right? And that's pretty close to where like Fire Island, Bacardi Island is. So you got to imagine that's what you want to put in your dome when you're thinking of what this area looks like, right? So let's go and talk about Bannister now. He was a successful merchant captain, as I mentioned. And now we're in 1680, right? And this dude, Lynch, who's like the governor in Port Royal, he gets a letter, right, in 1684. He gets a letter in 1684 to the British Council on Jamaica. So there's a council back in um, in freaking London, dude. And he's writing to them and he says, One banister ran away with the ship, the Golden Fleece. The cargo has a French commission and picked up a hundred men from sloops, smaller boats, in Leeward. Which maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a type of boat. I like to imagine in my head it's probably a dank tavern in Port Royal. And Bannister Cruz in there was like, bros, don't tell anyone, but when we set out sail with this cargo that we got right now, we're going to go pirate. We're going to do it. And these guys were like, 
let's go, bro. I've been working on a merchant vessel myself. I'm sure some of the guys worked under him on his merchant vessel. He's like, we're going to do this, dude. These other pirates are making a killing. We're getting paid whatever. And the But the weird part is that Bannister was probably getting paid okay. And he probably would have been able to retire very, very comfortably in London. So why is this dude going pirate in 1684? And um, after doing a little more research, a.k.a. fingering through my dog Robert Kirsten's book a little more, Bannister did... He was a captain of the Golden Fleece. He did take that ship. He did not have a French commission, in which would have made him a privateer. And since he did not have a French commission, he was a full-on freaking pirate, dude, which is sick, which is sick. So Governor Lynch dispatches the ruby. By the way, the Golden Fleece had 28 cannons. Decent. A lot of merchant vessels had cannons. So if you're a pirate, you would not really want to engage if it was a, a bigger ship than you because you would take these losses. You want it to... The pirate's sharpest sword, as Robert Curzon would said, is his reputation, which is sick to me. Right? Like, you got a dude, and there was a dude in high school named Geech, and everyone was like, dude, Geech brings a retainer to parties because he wants to fight. He doesn't want to get buzzed. He's straight edge. He just wants to maybe, you know, talk with his buddies, have a deep conversation, you know, talk about what new maroon shirt or black t-shirt or brown t-shirt with the same jeans he's going to wear, right? And then he's going to bring a retainer and hopefully just fight somebody, which is an amazing perspective to have. I want to get, I want to do the the history of the Geech of Geech, dude, just this dude who would bring a mouthpiece to party. But everyone knows about this guy and it was his reputation. I don't think I ever saw him fight. Not one time, not one time, but you didn't want to fight the guy. And that was pirates. When you'd hoist, and we all have that in our mind with the Jolly Roger flag, the skull and crossbones, when in fact... The main pirate flag was actually a blood red flag with an hourglass on it. And it was meant to symbolize that if uh, you mess with us or if you don't listen to us while we're coming up on you, your time left on earth will be short by the hourglass and blood red. That's poetry, dog. That's so sick. So these dudes are on the high seas. They're pulling off heists and they're doing poetic stuff. I like to imagine they'd have a skit night on their boat. I really like to imagine that would be sick. Summer camp lifestyle on one of these boats. Sign me up. Sign me up. Dude. You know what I mean? Things got to be desperate. You know, if I'm getting accepted, don't underestimate man's willingness to want to be appreciated. And maybe it's one of our biggest things. Maybe it's what we all have in common, being loved. Maybe it's being appreciated, you know? So it's very interesting to think about right there. And I think... I would thrive in skit night. I don't know about battle. I'm pretty soft. I'm pretty soft, and I'd need a few cattle skins to sleep on. You know, I get a stiff neck. I can't even really do a Wysocki puzzy puzzle. So although I do like saying puzzy, that's pretty sick. Dude, I'm going to do a puzzy with my GF. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text her that. Me and you, Wysocki puzzy tonight in a glass of Merlot. Let's do this. Anyway, that's freaking fire. Their reputation was the biggest, biggest uh, weapon that they had and now Bannister is going to go work on his reputation and let's talk about that dude which is freaking sick uh, Lynch dispatches the ruby to go track down Bannister in the Golden Fleece his ship of 28 cannons the ruby is one of the biggest ships in the Caribbean at the time crew of a buck 50 dudes ship weighed 540 tons it's a lot of LBs had 48 cannons Basically double what the Golden Fleece had um, in this time. So the, the Ruby's cruising around, like I mentioned earlier, Bannister, you know, he would do transatlantic stuff, but he'd post up in Port Royal. Uh, he's got connections there. He's been working in this, this area. He knows the Caribbean pretty well. He knows it like the back of his dong. So Bannister jacks a cargo Spanish ship, jacks the cargo of a Spanish ship, um, cruises to a beach, with his boys after jacking it. You know, this this news is getting back to uh, to Bannister somehow. I tried to research out, but I didn't know. Just in the book, it was like, oh, this, you know, or excuse me, it gets back to Lynch, and I don't, I don't know exactly how. But um, Bannister gets captured near the Cayman Islands after having a nice little run of piracy here. And he gets brought to Port Royal. Okay? By the way, Cayman Islands, sick little movie, uh, a sick location of that uh, T. Cruz movie, um, The Firm. Is it the firm, Aaron? Is that it? Uh, I'm not as familiar with the firm. I saw it a long time ago. It's pretty tight. I think uh, what's his face is in there. Gene Hackman. Speaking of heists and stuff, dude. Sick, sick movie. 
Anyway, dude, he gets brought to Port... Bannister gets brought to Port Royal by Lynch. Lynch is feeling happy, dude. He's, he's been looking for this guy for about a year and a half now. He's feeling happy, dude, right? And he has been pirating, dude. He jacked this Spanish ship. There's witnesses. It's guaranteed he'll be found guilty and made an example of because this was a guy who had a promising career. If you're a merchant... If you're working on a, a, a ship at the time, you're a crew member, and you see a captain, which maybe you hope to be one day, and then he's going pirate, and you're going, wait, there's guys even above me in my station in life that are going to go to a, a, a life of crime. Why? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for the system? You know what I mean? So as a governor, you're thinking of these things, and he's like, I got to make an example. I got to use fear as a tactic here. So basically, Bannister knows he's going to be killed. He's going to be put to death if he's found guilty. So what does Bannister do in true pilot fashion? He smuggles out two letters to bribe some people on the jury. Uh, fire move. And by the way, um, these are this is in Port Royal. These people live with, with pirates. Pirates are their neighbors. And it is quite a myth that um, uh, pirates always buried their treasure. Like they were actually, you know, good for the economy in a sense. It would be an instant influx. They'd jack something. They'd go to Tortuga. They'd go to Port Royal if they had a um, you know privateering contract. And they'd spend that stuff on booze, ladies, food, lodging, all that ish, weaponry, everything. So, you know, you got to ask yourself, are these good or bad things? You know, people are dying because of this, so probably bad. But, um, you know, the dollar seems to be uh, the king, you know, during any, any era, to be honest. And this is no different. But... Bannister bribes two Spaniards. So uh, Lynch is using these the sailors from this Spanish uh, vessel that they freaking jacked the cargo of, and he bribes them. And uh, during the trial, he swore that they sold him the boat that Bannister jacked and uh, paid them to serve on his boat, which is hilarious. Why in your life would you choose? Yeah, man, hey, what a great business deal. Let me take my boat that I have that's tough to come by. And... Um, you know, it's sort of like my liberty on the high seas, which is amazing uh, to think about. And uh, you know, let me go ahead and just uh, sell you that. And then on, on top of it, do part of the deal, dude, of me selling it to you is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come work. I'm going to come work for you. That's that's kind of what I want to do. It's like a, a huge step back in uh, social positioning. But after getting murked and being forced to work on Bannister's boat, which is unchill, which is unchill, but you could work your way up and become crew member if you fought well. Um... You got to like that, dude. Earn your way on the team. You know what I mean? Earn a scholarship um, and uh, through piracy. But uh, these guys took the bribe. He bribed them well. And Bannister gets off. He's acquitted. It works. The rest of the jury, I'm, like I'm saying, dude, it's a jury of your peers. These are people that might have delved in piracy, you know, and probably made money from people who delved in piracy. So Governor Lynch, and this is maybe not quite true, but he had some sort of illness. And after the ruling, he dies. So literally, he was so sick of the lack of justice, he dies. Freaking old times, dude. So then a new governor comes, this guy Molesworth, right? Freaking AKA Schmolesworth, dude. And this guy has it out for Bannister, and he wants to reopen the trial. Bro, Double Jeopardy, dude. Double Jeopardy, ever seen that movie? Watch it, pretty fun one. But it's denied, so thank you. Law's doing well. And this is where it comes into play where, you know, if, if Bannister wasn't, a British citizen at this time, he probably would have just been disrespected, would have been given no trial, maybe just killed. So terrible, unfair, unjust, but that's the reality of the times. So he's being shown these rights because of his British uh, citizenship. So Schmolesworth dude, wants to reopen this trial. Um, it's denied. And then Bannister, which is one of my favorite moments in the story here, he doubles down uh, like a true pirate legend and tries to sue the captain of the Ruby for hardships. Which is amazing. And the fact that in this era, heart, the word hardships exists is pretty great, dude. It seems like such a hard era. Like, you're working on these vessels. You're in these new lands. There's disease. There's <clears throat> all sorts of crazies. People are, you know, getting paid money when you lose arms. It's just hard living. It seems like everything's a hardship. But it's a great, great move by Bannister. Uh, so auda uh, audacious that, in fact, uh, Molesworth re-arrests Bannister for it. He just goes, you know what, dude, screw this. I'm the governor. 
um, you know, I'm going to send a letter to the freaking co commission on Jamaica and f get permission. No, nah, I'm forcing my hand here. I'm, 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 I'm using my power. I'm dropping the hammer. Rearrest Bannister, right? Uh, so after he gets arrested, bail is set. So, you know, he's not doing things too crazy. He's not being too tyrannical here. Bail would typically be, like I mentioned earlier, about 20 pieces for whatever Bannister was arrested for, probably being a, you know, rowdy outside of a bar or something like that. He probably found him on some minor charges. But set the bail to 300 pieces. That's huge. Remember, you lose an eye, it's 100 pieces, okay? This guy's getting bail for 300 pieces here, dude, right? Bannister uses his connections, dude. Probably talks to his boys, his crew, which is what I love. They're having each other's backs. One of the things that fires me up the most, most about pirates is having each other's backs, dude, not judging each other, dude. Just all having some like-minded goal, no matter how nefarious the goal was. You know, you got to just, it's, these are crazy times. You know, there's a lot of hardship, like I was saying earlier. And uh, dude makes bail. Bannister makes bail, 300 pieces. Legit. So he's broke. He had to do, he had to pull everything he could, desperate move. So now he's just wandering around Port Royal, probably looking like one of those animatronic dudes from Pirates of the Caribbean, like real creepy, like, nah, making this noise all the time. You know, he's probably the dude that's like, while you're going by there, like sitting with the pigs or something like that with like one bottle of rum, but so stoked on that rum. And he's just down and out. You know what I mean, dude? He's He was a captain. He's gone from having a promising, retiring, uh, you know, in London with a good salary and some respect and probably could write a sick book on his travels and sell it and even make more, right? And make a name for himself doing that. But is he trying to make for a name, a name for himself doing something else? Is that what's driving him? Maybe. Maybe. And will he? I mean, we're talking about it today, but why? Up to right now, he's just jacked one Spanish vessel, pulled a few good legal moves. I mean, that's a not that sick of a movie. I mean, you get one good scene out of it, Jack and the Spanish Vessel. Then you get some courtroom stuff. Do we make this a courtroom movie? There's too many of those. You know, the biggest, best courtroom movie in the Caribbean is um, got to be, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm blanking on the movie right now. A Few Good Men. Thank you very much. Finally came to me. But not that sick yet. So how is Bannister going to make a name for himself? Well, here we go. He's cruising around Port Royal. He's sitting there. He's sipping on his rum, if he's even got lucky enough to have some. He might just be drinking some regular grog, which is like a lemon-based liquid, which is basically like he's doing a cleanse. He's basically in a juice cleanse, cruising around Port Royal, getting tan still because the sun's beaming and it's nice. You know what I mean? And probably eating some plantains or something like that. And uh, he's been plotting during this time he's plotting to jack the golden fleece back and so what does he do one night he cruises down there middle of the night foggy night waits for the fall fog's cruising in there's dudes already down there that he's had relationships with a man's greatest and I forget who said it maybe it was Khalil Gibran that book the prophet a man's grasp should be greater than his reach. Oh, no, excuse me. What am I saying? I, I literally just got it wrong. A man's reach should be greater than his grasp. So it means influence rather than have. And Bannister's got that influence. His crew is already down there untying the golden fleece. About 25 dudes. They go down there. They jack it. They push off. They only use low sails. They're going out of the harbor slow, dude. Slow, bro. Okay. Luckily, there's a little bit of wind this night. You got to have a little bit of luck, which is so pirate. I love that. They're cruising. No one's seen them. It's still dark. You know, they're waiting. They, they've timed this when there's not a bright moon. <clears throat> a little bit of fog cover. But to get going, they're using a little coastal freaking breeze, right? That's what they're going to use. These are, you know, these are freaking uh, sailors. Dude. They know how to use this stuff, dude. And they know the depth. They can go along the coast and they can't get out real quick. And they need to sneak out because the other ships that are in that harbor, the Ruby, there's uh, other ones that are that I'm going to mention a little bit that are there that are faster, better vessels. You know, they got smaller, faster ones and bigger ones that can just destroy them. So they really got to sneak out. I and mean, the main threat to them is this fort, I think it's Fort Charles, is sitting up above Port Royal on the high ground, which is the smart tactical freaking move with cannons, which at this time cannons, I mean, from land, maybe the best ones I think could maybe go... 
thousand to two thousand yards, but then you're elevated, so you can get out. Was that a mile from elevation? Maybe a little bit more. Um, you know how accurate would you be? Not great, but a ton of big cannons. You know, depending on how how many pounds they were, and Fort Charles probably had heavier, a lot heavier ones than what would be on a boat. So, and you know, in your boat, you're not firing maybe too far away, especially on, a, on your pirate vessel. You're using self defense. But anyway, they're well within the range of these cannons. And with the amount at Fort Charles coming down on them, to, you know, accuracy becomes irrelevant because there's just so many that would be aimed there. So if they get spotted, they're toast. They've got to be sneaky. They've got to be lucky. And they're going and they're getting a little bit of luck. And they're just coming out of range of Fort Charles and they're hoisting the big sails and they're spotted, dude. Someone spots them. They see the big sails and they start firing and they take a little bit of heat but they got far enough out to where they can get away and slip in um, to, you know, any little inlet or something like that away from the ships if they needed to, but they had enough of a head start where even if they started dispatching the other faster, um, smaller ships, they'd have a pretty solid head start on them. So that's a 16. That's a good high scene. You might need to take some artistic liber liberties to make it more exciting, but in real life, that's compelling stuff, dude. That's amazing stuff. He cruises away. And then Schmolesworth is tracking him now for like, honestly, he Bannister goes pirate in 84. Um, and then like, he's out there for a while, just murking and raiding and doing pirate stuff. And then in 86, Schmolesworth had enough. He dispatches two more boats, <clears throat> the Falcon and the Drake. Falcon's got 42 guns. The Drake has 16 guns. Pretty sick name of boats. I'm liking the names of these boats, dude. Their mission as uh, being dispatched by Schmolesworth is to seek and destroy, right? So Bannister um, is spotted. He's spotted careening. And careening is a process. And so someone had to betray him. You know, I mean, you don't get enemies doing, you know, being a pirate. I mean, you do get lots of enemies being a pirate, obviously. So someone spots Bannister and goes, oh, well, Molesworth wants him done and he just jacked one of my buddies and he maybe he'll jack me. I mean, he's a pirate and, you know, the dollar is, I guess, their king. So, or rum or whatever it is, or maybe the dude next to them is their greatest treasure. And that's what I like to think about, you know, this whole time of seeking treasure. It's standing right next to you, dude. And uh, he gives the position of Schmolworth. So Schmolworth dispatches these two ships, the, the, the uh, Falcon and the Drake, to seek and destroy while he's careening, which is a very vulnerable position. Careening is where... You take your boat up, um, your ship up to the uh, shoreline. You got to find a good bay that's, uh, you know, not, and this is Samana Bay. And if you look at it, it's kind of like a, kind of a weird little sea. So you can't really get hit from the back. You, there's only one little way in. It's a good place to careen because um, you're going to be vulnerable. Your ship's on its side. It's basically beached, but the tide will come back in. And uh, they're working and doing maintenance on it and stuff, you know, taking off barnacles if they've got hit by a cannon, whatever, replacing wood, all that type of stuff. You, you just got to do it. This is something you got to do with ships of that era. Um, but it's vulnerable. But Bannister being a legend, uh, he finds out, because if he's got also got some friends, that they're coming for him, dude. And what does he do? He gets the high ground, dude, Fort Charles style, dude. Takes some of his cannons off the boat. And at this time, I, I think he had murked another smaller ship that had like maybe 10 guns on it. I forget the name of it, but it was with him as well. And so the fleece was vulnerable. This other smaller ship's just kind of chilling there. And he, he uses that, positions it to like watch one flank and then gets the high ground, sends some pirate bros up into the, the grounds and uh, puts cannons in a high position, right? And these two big ships are coming. They've got way more guns. They've got way more resources. They've got everything. They know where they're coming in from. But Bannister's using his his surroundings to the best of his abilities. These ships come in, dude. Their mission is seek and destroy. They battle. This is a great scene. This is where the movie the movie got good during jacking the ship back out uh, after the trial. And now it's amazing. You get this huge epic battle scene, dude. Um, you would imagine. I mean, battles in this era. How long do they last? Like. People, the ship moves up to the side. They shoot out the mast, blah, blah, blah. They come in there a few hours. This battle goes eight hours, bro. Goes into the next day even, dude. This is a two-day battle, right? Naval experts say this battle should have only gone an hour or two, resulting in the defeat of Bannister. These are 
naval experts looking back at, at the uh, weaponry available, the tactics and everything, even knowing ba where Bannister's guys were in the hills, knowing they said this should have been an, an hour or two battle in a resounding British victory. These pirates got heart. They last two days. The British run out of ammo. They need to go back and get more supplies. They're out of gunpowder. They're out of everything. They've taken some losses and they have to go back to Port Royal and which is risky at this time because um, you could get, uh, you could lose your captain license. You could be uh, censored, C-E-N-S-U-R-E-D. Maybe there's a British censured and uh, punished. Like you could even, you could be killed, jailed, something like that at the time. So it was risky for these captains to go back with their tails tucked. But, you know, uh, Molesworth knew that Bannister was a pretty legendary dude and he wanted him gone. So he's not going to decommission these captains. You got to get new captains. He's like, I'd be shooting myself in the foot. He loads them up. He sends them back out, right? Upon the return, the pirates have fled. But this is one of the mo biggest uh, victories and biggest uh, standoffs against a greater, greater force in maybe the history of all of piracy in the Caribbean. So this marks Bannister as being a straight up true freaking legend. So he gets away again. The guy is unstoppable. He's been arrested. He's, he's been acquitted. He's been, uh, he's bought his way out, um, made bail. And then he escapes the city, steals his ship twice, right? Steals it the first time. Then he steals it again, jacks it right from the harbor, right from under the nose. And then he's pinned down and the guy holds his ground, dude, him and his crew, they hold their ground, right? Dude turns pirate in 84. Now we're in 1687. He's had a pretty solid run. He gets captured. Uh, him and his men are captured on the Mosquito Coast. It's not called the Mosquito Coast because of um, the bugs. It's a mosquito because of the Spanish word for musket. Guys there would use musket and ito for small. They were, uh, this is a very culture insensitive and uh, straight up just racist term because they would say the natives of that time, that uh, area were tiny. This was a Mosquito Coast where he is is like Nicaragua and Honduras, I believe, Bannister's in Nicaragua. That's where he's ca captured, so um, <clears throat> on the Mosquito Coast. And uh, Schmolesworth orders the execution of Bannister aboard the Drake, which is unusual because, like I mentioned earlier, he has British citizenship. Um, but, because it, but, but he knew Bannister was so wily, right? This guy, he's wily, dude. He's going to escape. So what happens is... As Bannister, and like we mentioned earlier, which Lynch wanted to do, as they're cruising back into Port Royal on the Drake, you know, the mast of the ship, you got the little T-shaped thing. Um, it's called the yard arm. Bannister and three of his cohorts are hung. Boom. It was illegal. That's not legal for Schmolesworth to do. He should have been given a trial. This is our new circumstances, new crimes that he's been committing um, and the dude is killed but he's still a dank pirate legend and that is the story of Joseph Bannister and I think this Mark Twain quote that I pulled from Kirsten's book is quite quite sums up how I feel about pirates it says now and then we had a hope that if we lived and were good God would permit us to be pirates Mark Twain. Couldn't agree more. You know, they're doing a lot of bad, but they're having each other's backs. They're chilling. And I'd like to address one thing about pirates that maybe I got some beef with is the fact that they wouldn't let ladies on the boat because of, um, they said it was bad luck. But I got to say, I think that's, I don't know, dude. You know, I think that's kind of untrue. I think these captains were wise guys. You know, I think, yeah, they had, you know, there was definitely myths going on, the Kraken and all that stuff. But I think the captain just knew that to get the most out of their men, um, they needed horniness and constant horniness. I think that's really what drove the pirates. And I think, you know, if you're young dudes, I think it's really what drives economies. Why get a job on Wall Street? Why do anything? It's because you're a pretty horny dude. You know, you think about, look at the structures we build as modern men. They're shaped like dongs. You know, all the tools that the dudes are using, hammers, drills, it's our dongs. I think horniness is just the all spark of civilization. I think pirate captains were the first ones to discover that.
that's my theory on not letting the ladies on the boat because why not? And there were lady pirates. You know what I mean? It was like, come on. So just my take might not be the right one, but you got to hear the wrong take to get the right take sometimes. Um, anyway, dude, that's my share. Joseph Bannister. What a freaking dank pirate legend, dude. The wily Joseph Bannister. So now at this point, I feel like we'll take a few writing questions and then we'll call it, you know, a few stuff. So let's see what we got. I got, um, dude, I, I sent out in a, uh, little Instagram post and got some dank, 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 dank stuff from, um, from some, some stokers here. So let's see what we got. This one's a little long, so let's see. What up, Strider? So stoked on the new pod. Thank you, dude. Same. You are so deserving of having your own podcast. Too freaking kind, dude. I was listening to my dog, Joe Rogan, the other day, and one of his guests was talking about all the high-ranking Nazi officers <clears throat> who escaped to South America after World War II and settled in villages where they quickly established their German roots in those communities. My question to you is, do you think Hitler could have escaped to South America or North Africa and not have killed himself? The evidence is not set in stone for either side of the argument, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts of this. Also, do you think the treaties made after WW2 that were uh, effective in removing and preventing most fascist governments were not good enough treaties, and as a result, we're still fighting communism 70 years later um, as a result of these inaccurate treaties made to terminate the war as quick as possible? Uh, sorry for the long question. I'm very curious on your thoughts. Dude, yes, little con he says a uh, little conspiracy theory. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it's fun to talk about, fun to think about. No, nah, dude, I mean, I got to think Hitler did kill himself. I do know, like, uh, there was that movie, uh, Operation Finale, that came out of them, like, tracking down Heinrich Himmler, I believe. Was it Himmler, Aaron, do you know, that was in Argentina? Uh, I mean, the, the most famous one they caught was uh, Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann, that's it. Yeah. It's Eichmann, who was the architect of the final solution, right? Yeah. Yeah, terrible bad guy. Glad that we got him. Um so yeah, I mean, there was definitely some dudes. There's, you know, like a, like with myth and everything, and it's fun to think about in history, it's got to be rooted in some sort of true. I mean, you do have true circumstances, but I do think with Hitler that he probably, he went down, he took his own life. He's such a uh, greedy and, or a, you know, self-absorbed megalomaniac that he'd probably take his, his own life. I think that would make the most sense for him to do. Um, as far as the treaties are concerned, I think... Um, yeah, dude, I think they wanted it done. I think people were tired of losing lives. I think, you know, even after the Vietnam War with the Khmer Rouge, like where it would have been great if the American government helped suppress that. But after sacrificing, you know, 58,000 lives in Vietnam, um, they uh, they freaking, uh, you know, American citizens were, were tired of spending those lives. So we were start tired and maybe the treaties were a little bit rushed. They could have been, I don't know all the facts about them at that time, but... Um, in, in the fascists were the ones that we were fighting really and at the end of the war yet yeah, was the communists and maybe you know there's a theory that says why did we really drop the a-bomb we could have dropped it in the middle of the desert and then written to the japanese but then you know my boy dan carlin talks about the resolve of japanese uh, soldiers and i even there was even a guy that was held out in the 70s and there was multiple instances of guys 15 years still holding down and only being able to you know in like the philippines and uh, still killing people in like the 70s and they, their old commanders would have to come and tell them to stop so pretty wild so um it's an argument to be made about the a-bomb which is interesting you know a moral one <clears throat> the strategic one was it uh serving a greater good or just a display against the communists was that the big part of the quote treaty that didn't exist really um so it's interesting great questions um i would say yeah, I mean, I, that's a good one, dude. I mean, are we still fighting it today? Yeah, I mean, you can't change. It, it seems like it's a psychological thing. Like if there's countries, if the people are, I don't know if they're they're happy there in North Korea. They're definitely not. I went to Vietnam. I went to North, to Vietnam with my GF. Um, it definitely was a very eye-opening experience being there of like, dude, there's announcements on loudspeakers all the time of and you know they play like very hyper nationalistic music it's it was a little bit eerie for sure so yeah i think you know you gotta ask is it a battle that's worth fighting is it a battle that we can take on as america are we the world or should we be the world's police like i mean that's 
pretty wild to think about. Um, and we've been unsuccessful. Vietnam, Korea, these countries are divided. So would treaties have done it? Would they have gone and broke those treaties? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, hey, so I'm coming for advice, IDK, if you read it. But in, I was uh, in a three-year on-and-off relationship. Okay, relationship advice. And he meant a lot to me. He started acting very different was short with messages and no conversation. It just got sad. <clears throat> I'm in love with him, but we broke up three days ago. Damn. Today he said he didn't care about us anymore. I don't know how to respond to it because I don't want to bug him. I'll keep anonymous. Dude, screw this guy. You kidding me? This guy's got no time of day. All right? If this, if I was on Bannister's boat, dude, this guy would get marooned, dude. And I love marooning. It's basically the invention of time outing on, a, on an island, dude. It's like, look, dude, you're being unchilled, dude. You're being annoying, dude. You got to go to an island. This guy should get marooned. And, you know, you're too good for uh, for this dude. You don't want to bug him. You got to value yourself more here. Don't worry about this guy. Worry about you. He's not respecting a relationship. It's going to be tough because, they, you know, love is blind. But, uh, you know, can make you do things that aren't, aren't aren't rational sometimes, like still giving this guy time of day. I'm saying cut him loose. He's done. Move move on. Get someone who values you. You are worth it. Let's see here. <clears throat> hey, Strider, I want to reach out for some advice from the relation expert. I commented on your last pick asking you about your thoughts on oil rigs, and you dropped some fire knowledge encouraging stokers, encouraging stokers around the world to oil their rigs. It's true. I was wondering how we can best live out the message of oiling our rigs. Do you have any tips on how to best oil a rig? Maybe some coconut oil, post bench press. Any and all advice would be appreciated. Stay golden and psyched. Thank you, my dog. Stay golden, pony boy. Dude, uh, yeah, bro. I'm all about more oiled rigs and less oil rigs, you know, protecting the waters, dude. Um, yeah, I mean, dude, there's no right or wrong way. Use some coconut oil, use some baby oil. I like to use Johnson's. I got sensitive skin. They usually do good stuff like that. Uh, some Johnson's baby oil, dude. Oil the rig up, dude, and post up with my boys. Kind of nice for getting a little bronze, but you don't want to stay out too long. You might get, you know, a little sunburnt, not healthy for you. But, um, yeah, dude, go out there jacked, dude. Put it on your quads, dude. Don't neglect the legs. So many of us neglect the legs when oiling up. And, um, yeah, it's just important to do that. And just, I think it just boosts stoke, you know? You're in Miami, you're in a city, you know, tropical, you're on vacation, dude. You're going to want to see some oiled rigs. I mean, let's be honest. Let's, let's be true to ourselves. We're all, you're hanging out at the pool, you're in Vegas, whatever, you're on a cruise ship, I don't know, dude. You're looking at the rigs around the pool. <clears throat> you're looking at other dudes' rigs, and you're going, that's tight. And if some guy puts in the extra effort to oil it up for you because he knows you're looking, that's even more tight. So, yeah, dude. I think the only way, you, the best, my advice for you is when oiling a rig, know that others are looking, do your best. And I think it's just, it's just a good way to boost stoke for others and for yourself. You know what I mean? Get some good lighting, you know, flex the tries, do get a little horseshoe going on in there. Maybe just, if you're starting out at oiling your rig, maybe just do the triceps. It's a good place to start. Or the calves. What up, Stoke God Strider? Just wondering about your thoughts on badass presidents from the 20th century. Looking forward to the new pod. Thank you, my dog. Glad to hear that there's uh, more H buffs out there like myself. Love that, dude. Yeah, there's tons of us out here. Let's go. Um, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt's the go-to here, dude. He's like kind of the outdoorsman, badass dude, freaking leathernecks, Spanish-American War. Um, yeah, he's kind of the go-to. I mean, you know... If you were alive today, he'd definitely be wearing shorts and an Under Armour polo to weddings with, like, sandals. You know, definitely could see that. So he's sick. Um, maybe FDR, dude. I mean, getting us through WW Deuce, dude. And he's kind of enigmatic, dude. Once again, calling back to my boy Dan Carlin, dude. You guys should always take a shot if you're watching this pod. Take a sip of your dip every time I mention Dan Carlin. Um Fired up on, uh, since he died in office, Dan Carlin mentioned we never got a memoir on him or people didn't know these many so much about him. So I think he just, guy got four terms, dude, through WW2, set the groundwork for what's going on today. Would like to, I think he's got to be the legend, dude. No secondary, I mean, yeah, we don't have the primary source on him. It's all like secondary sources. So it's interesting. Um, let's see. 
Strider Bro. I'm a high school history teacher in Montana, and I'm excited to hear you're doing a history podcast. I have a few questions that might be interesting to talk about on the pod. Where do you stand on the topic of 16th to 18th century Caribbean pirates? Bro, this is exactly what we talked about today. In fact, this email came in today at 9.54. Amazing, dude. Uh, were they a band of Robin Hoods seeking to escape an immobile social th- hierarchy, or were they murderers and thieves out for themselves? I mean, bro, this is exactly how I was planning to even sum up today's pod. Um, and, you know, can we use history as a roadmap for ourselves today? You know, we look at our past. I mean, any company, any corporation, any thing you do in baseball, sports, other sports, whatever it is, you study you look at the stats, you look at the past to try to predict the, what's to come. Um, and I think, uh, I was going to say, looking back at these pirates, how can we use them as an example for ourselves today? Uh, you know, obviously you don't want to be murdering thieves, but you got to maybe pull a banister and do something that's going to, you know, make a name for yourself. Achilles, the movie of Troy is hilarious. Brad Pitt has a hilarious line to that kid in the beginning he just totally disrespects him the kid's like I forget what he says but like Brad Pitt wakes up from a threesome hilarious and uh, he's like going to battle and he's like what are you gonna like I could never do something he's like and Achilles looks like that's why your name will never be remembered to like some 12 year old not even like probably some 8 year old kid just totally being mean just imagine they say never meet your heroes dude I mean uh, you know so what are we gonna do to make a name for ourselves today I think it's just by being legit to the people we got relationships with in our lives you know make a name as a dank bf make a name as a dank dude at your work make a name as a dude who brings in and out to the office on fridays or whataburger whatever part of the country you're in dude five guys i don't know you know be a chiller dude bring the energy be enthusiastic make a name guys enthusiastic that's what i would be doing you know what i mean in 17th century maybe that was being a pirate maybe it's even maybe you got more ambition than just being enthusiastic how you how do you take that enthusiasm so that was kind of going to be my closing statements, a little encouragement, but I love um, what this dude wrote. I mean, yeah, it, that's the exact that's the exact question, and I, I think it's unanswered. I think it's it's yes, they were murdering, blundering thieves. Why were they stealing from the rich? Always Robin Hood style? No, not really. They were killing dudes who were just doing their jobs on boats and merchant vessels. Not chill. Um, was it for their own was it vainglorious I don't know Bannister's case maybe maybe he was fed up maybe it was like a Scotty Pippen thing he's like I deserve I need to get paid now let's go fascinating that's why I love it the unanswered question and then also what do you think the toughest decision a US president has ever made ha- ever had to make and do you agree with the decision they made Dang, I don't know. That's a very, very difficult question. Just because of what I was talking about earlier. Um, maybe Truman dropping the, the atomic bombs. Why was it dropped? Was it to flex on the, against the communists and taking that much life that quickly and the long lasting effects? Was it really to save American lives? Was it more so for the Russians? These things are still debated. Very, very tough um, decision. Don't say I can agree with it. Could have dropped it. But, you know, that's uh, the world we live in. And that's what's fascinating. We are the sum of our shared experiences. And that is tragically one of them. Anyway, fired up to have done the first pod. Fired up to get one done in the can. Looking good, feeling good. Um, looking forward to more. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed. Um, this one was a little more verbose. I'd like to keep these a little tighter, but we had an intro a little bit and um, we're getting our bearings. You know what I mean? I get my sea legs, if you will, on Bannister's boat. So hopefully we're enjoying. Please write in um, with any uh, questions or comments or suggestions for topics that would fire you up if you've got cool stuff, even personal stuff, whatever area you're from, your city, anything like that. I want to do it any of uh, your uh, heritage, anything. I want it to be not so um, hyper America and focused. I want it to be more worldly. I want to challenge myself to learn about these things and we can learn together 
as we go on this journey um, of understanding each other and this freaking rock we're spinning around on, dude. So let's uh, let's do it. Fired up. Email me at uh, Strider Wilson Shreds at gmail.com. It's Strider with an I, dude. And uh, yeah, so freaking stay stoked. And thank you, my dogs, dude. Late.